because he lives. That's a wonderful song for this Memorial Day, isn't it? Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians, please. We've had many delays, and special speakers, and so on, but uh, we are going to get something out of this book. In 1951, I started teaching in the, in the month of August in this book, and we had a wonderful time. In 1951, that's been a good long while ago, hasn't it? That's approaching a quarter of a century one of these days. Uh, but uh, it's up to date. It's as up to date as the headlines on the morning newspaper, even though Mr. Nixon may be in, in uh, some Russian city. Uh, this Bible is just as up to date as the headlines in that paper. And if you people believe this, if you'll accept it, if you'll stay with it, you'll never be disappointed because this book will not let you down. You know, the Lord Jesus, before he, before he went away, he said, All things must be fulfilled, which was written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. I've been doing much reading in the past two weeks. I don't have a lot of time to read like I like to. I enjoy reading. I read everything. I've read... And I think I have a working knowledge of the editorial philosophy of every one of the major newspapers in America. And this is saying a great deal, but I read the New York Times, which is paper number one, the Los Angeles Times out your way, which is number two, and the Courier Journal, which is Louisville, the number three paper in America, the Wall Street Journal, which is number four. And I could call the roll, the Baltimore Sun, the Cincinnati Inquirer, which I look upon as one of the great newspapers. The Cincinnati Post and Times Star, pretty good scandal sheet, as a lot of them are, you know, and delving in personal diatribes about various things. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you know, they have some good writers in that paper. And I'm just talking about the editorial philosophy. But you can learn a great deal. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. Don't be, don't be lulled into some kind of a state of shock or in a condition that would lead you to think that, well, everything's going to be all right in the world now. We've signed the, the arms agreement with Russia. And we've uh, done this and that. Just remember that all of the pieces are being put together for the Third World War, which in all probability will be that apocalyptic judgment we read about in the book of the Revelation. And i got news for you. Before that one's ever fought, we're not going to be here. We're just not going to be here. Somebody said to me some time ago, Brother John, do you believe they'll build the, uh, do you believe they'll build the temple in Jerusalem? Well, my own personal opinion, and it's not well for preachers to indulge in opinions from the pulpit, but uh, as a Christian to another, it's my own opinion that uh, the... Uh, the uh, temple will be built after the rapture. And the man of sin then will dedicate that temple and he'll dedicate it like Anto Antiochus Epiphanes did with the offering of a sow upon the altar. Uh, I think when he desecrated the temple. And it's my own personal opinion that we are going to be raptured before that time comes. The Ten King Federation of Europe has already settled. The Ten, the common market. You know that? And uh, there, you can't get around the fact in Daniel and in Ezekiel, other major prophets, as well as some of the minor prophets, and in the book of the Revelation, there is a Ten King Federation. And you can't get around the fact that Russia is going to figure prominently in, 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 the, in the day of destruction. Now, you need to keep all of these things in mind and just remember that, that God raises up kings and he puts them down. Now, I don't mean to be critical or I'm not offering alibis or I'm not, I'm just saying that we who are Christians need to keep looking up because our solution is not in Moscow or Beiping, it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to keep this in mind. Now, with verse 15, I think this is about where Harold finished Sunday. We've been talking about a man's work. Not his redemption, but his work. 
We're talking about a man's reward. Many years ago when I started preaching, I decided that I wanted to have a full reward, if it's possible, when I meet my Lord face to face. And uh, any man can have a full reward. Any woman can have a full reward. You don't have to be a preacher or missionary to have a full reward. If you do what you're supposed to do right, you will have your reward. And keep in mind, beloved, that God takes note of faithfulness. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2, and we'll come back to this verse a little later. Notice chapter 4 and verse 2, these words, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found, say it. All right, say it again. Now you see, he didn't say successful, influential. Well now, I'm fully cognizant of this, travel, travel like I have, uh, there are people in my church that you'll never have a long-distance phone call from somebody to say, well, you've blessed my life, and, and uh, thus and so. And I've had preachers call me and ask anything I can do, anything I can do, and I appreciate all of that. But you know, that doesn't change one blessed truth in the Word of God that I don't care how successful and how influential you may have been amongst other people, brother and sister, God doesn't reward you for that. He rewards you for being faithful with what you have. Now, do you understand that? All right, then, the, as I started to say, the humblest little woman in this church, doing what she can. She may have been deprived of the bed, breadwinner of her home, and she may have had to rear her children. My wife was talking about this a woman the other day. I think it had eight children or something like that. Her husband ran off with another man. And this lady had worked with her own hands and fed her children and schooled her children. And my wife said she had never met a more wonderful person in all her life. This little woman had been faithful to her family. And uh, she had worked with her own hands. You ought to read the last chapter of the book of Proverbs, ladies. But let me tell you something. Get it now. And if this burns in your soul, it'll make a different person out of you. God is going to reward you for your faithfulness. Faithful with your talents. Faithful with your time. And I have people to say, Brother John, don't work so hard. Please don't say that to me. Man, it's hard enough to get up ahead of steam to do what I do. <laughs> you know? Good Lord, you don't need self-pity. The Bible said to crucify the flesh, to die daily. I'm going to live as long as God wants me to live anyway. Of all the corpses I've ever buried, I've never buried one that died because they worked for Jesus too hard. I keep this in mind. <laughs> no, sir, never have. Never will. Do you understand that the, the truth of this business Theoretically, you may understand it, but in reality, you may not. Look at it again. I'm talking to people who are retired in this church. And you retired to do one word, and that's die. God have mercy. Don't retire to die. Retire to serve God. And ask Him for days and years to make yourself productive and to make yourself fruitful. Did you notice what that 15th verse says? A man's work? It's possible for it to be burned in that third chapter. And he'll suffer loss. If you've ever lived in the country and had a burnout, no insurance, you get some concept of that word loss. Got out of a car the other day with the preacher we were going to eat a few weeks ago in another state. Said, you're going to lock it? He said, no, it's worn out. Somebody will steal it. Why? They'll relieve me of a burden. But uh, really, I think he's sort of disgusted with it. He'd had it in the hospital a time or two and having it worked on. Wasn't breathing very well or something. But uh, 
You know, to waste your life is a terrible thing. Notice what that verse said again. He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be what? Saved. Now, some of you people sitting here this morning, and let me say this in a vein you'll understand. You're going to come down to the end of the way. One of the most frustrated individuals that's ever been. Numbered among that crowd that says, What in the world have I done with my life? I've literally wasted my life, and I don't have anything to show for it. I don't have anything of any lasting value. Brother, if you're not investing in the master's business of yourself, you need this sermon. Because if you're here and unsaved this morning, you by rights belong to God in creation. I said something some time ago about the Methodists. I guess the last Sunday night I preached on the radio about them endorsing, at least giving license to homosexuals down in Atlanta. And I got a letter from a woman down in Louisiana. And she, she was very unhappy with me. She listened to me on radio that I'd made this statement and said, really, the Methodists didn't endorse them. But you know what she said in that letter? And I get it, and I'm quoting her. Said, don't you know that they are all the children of God? Now, brother, you take something hard to swallow. If you read Romans, and I'm writing her a letter, uh, chapter 1, three times God gave those people up. But this shows you the distortion of the minds of people today that can't think, and think straight. What are you thinking today about your life? You say, well, that's a terrible thing for a woman. But are you going to waste your life? Shall suffer loss. Now, go on. Note in verse 16, know you not that you are the temple of God. The temple of God. God dwells in you. God dwells in me. His Holy Spirit dwells in me. I read an article. A young man had been studying... Uh, spiritualism and all of the Eastern cults and and uh, it's 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 a thing that is sweeping this nation. We are in a heathen nation. We may have on our coin in God we trust, but literally thousands upon thousands of college students and professors are involved in this in sciences and talking to the dead and all of this business. And you know what's wrong with these people? You want me to tell you? They're empty. And you find them described in the book of Luke. When those evil spirits had gone out of a man, they came back and they found it empty and swept and garnished. And they moved back in. Let me tell you something, brother. When the Spirit of God lives in you, there's not room enough for demons in there. And you are a potential candidate this morning for spirits. Either within your bosom dwells the Holy Spirit of God, or else in your body could dwell evil spirits. I'm glad the Spirit of God dwells in me. I may not know a lot of things, but bless the Lord, I know that when I was converted, the Lord Jesus Christ in the person of the paraclete, the Holy Ghost of God, moved within. And I am His today, and He witnesses with my spirit that I am a son of God. And you know how I know I'm a Christian? Because the Holy Spirit leads me in the study of the book. Search the Scriptures, not the commentaries. I tell young preachers this all over the country. Search the Scriptures. You say, don't you believe in reading commentaries? Sure. With a lot of mental reservations. But the book said under inspiration, search the Scriptures. And that's what we need to do today. Study to show thyself approved unto God. And if you learn right, then you're going to dis discipline your, your body right. I believe that the Spirit of God gives us control over mind and over matter. You say, well, explain that. All right, I'll be glad to. I believe that the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in your heart will help you to live like a Christian and to die like a Christian. It's just that simple. I really believe that. Know you not that you 
are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Notice that preposition, in you. You see a little lady walk into the building expecting. We've had a little granddaughter born into our family, Harold and Sylvia have a sweet little granddaughter. And uh, you know, it's sort of funny. Drove over yesterday to see, I'd, I'd seen her only once. And uh, they have another one, little Jojo, that's two year old now, just turned two. And of course, you know how a grandmother will be over the granddaughter? Well, you know, Jojo and I took up together and he said, Granddaddy, let's run away. I said, okay. <laughs> that kid's got something in his mind about wanting to run away. And I said, let's go, boy. And so he led me out of the house, down the steps, and we got out and he said, play ball. And he's learned from his older brothers about the basketball and he calls it two points. He said two points. I said, okay, we'll, we'll play two points. And that kid, only two years old, recognized that somebody else had moved into the realm that he had been occupying. You know, it's strange. But he knew his granddaddy had something for him, and he cut those little piercing eyes up at me, and he knew granddaddy wasn't going to take that little thing that moved in on him. He just knew that. And uh, I didn't. I didn't even hold the grandbaby. You say, well, why didn't you? Well, you know, men have a way of communicating with each other. If he'd have seen me take a woman in my arms, it would sort of upset him. So uh, uh, he and I just butted together, and I picked him up, and we talked a while. And, and uh, uh, you know, you have to watch it, folks. Now, this is a, this is a sideline, but what am I trying to say? I'm trying to tell you that a little child can understand. And you as a little child can understand. Don't tell me you can't. You're God's child. You may be a month old in grace. You may be 50 years old, but you're still a child in grace. And you need to get this thing straight here. He dwells in you. And if you want God to show you any favoritism, and I use that in a loose sort of way, then you better, you better love him right. You wouldn't think I'd take little Jojo and set him aside and you know, he's just a little bit disturbed, as children will be, as any psychologist will tell you. But you know, his granddaddy made him feel important, and we, we ran away. All right, now, if you can get this straight, what the Spirit of God's trying to get you to see, that you are presently and will always be occupied by the Holy Spirit, and that will be the controlling powers and influences in your life to guide you and to direct you and to make you fruitful unto every good work. All right, now notice he talks about the defilement of the temple of God. Oh, how sad it is for us to defile the temple of God. Verse 7, 17 it is, if any man defile the temple of God. What, notice what God says, him, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. You can't defile that, whole, that temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells. Habits, attitudes, disposition. Let me tell you something, brother. Some of you are on a, on a broad, you're, you're on, you're on a, a glider, so to speak, of destruction. Last night I turned the television on and I watched this, uh, the Indianapolis 500. Now, this sounds crazy to you. And I said to my brother-in-law, I said, you know, I could, have, I could have made the Indianapolis 500. In fact, you get a kick out of this. I, I said, I could have won that. Isn't that awful? Well, you know, a man that's out there with 30 cars, if he doesn't think he can do it, he's not going to do it. Somebody's going to do it, right? And I, I'd have one thirtieth of a chance to do it. And I watched that wheel leave that car. And saw that car hit that, that, him, that abutment and then go nearly back across the track and then back over and hit it again. And then that fellow, I admired his courage. I liked the way he got out. He started rolling to get the fire off. He had, he had presence of mind to get that fire else's clothes and burn. He'd, he'd, you know, it could destroy him. 
There's a great lesson in this. Some of you people are on fire today, and you don't have forethought enough and presence of mind enough to put it out. Did you not read up there where there's a fire that's going to try man's work? And my works are just as much a part of me as the clothes I wear or the body in which I dwell. My works, really, they're me. Because that's part of my life. You can't separate. You can't separate these things. Does that make sense? i tell you what it'll do. It'll put some people on the get-up-and-go business, and you'll be here for their station, and you'll take some albums of Bob Harrington's of Truth, Laughter, and Music, and you'll play them for neighbors. One of my men said to me this week, he came by and said, Brother John, don't want to bother you, but he's telling about where he works. He works in a, in a, he works in a, in a, for a steel company. And you know what he said to me? He said, Brother John, the roughest, wickedest man in that plant. I've told them about those uh, those uh, albums, and you know what they said to me? They said, we want one. We want one. Inherently in the bodies and minds of those wicked men is the desire to know something about the man who talks about God. Bob Harrington becomes merely an instrument of in the hand of God. And folks, you work with people, and you're related with people that need to hear those messages. I don't know, we may have some of the copies here supposed to have. I hope we have them here. Uh, but anyway, for you to begin to distribute them, to hand them out, to see that they're distributed to people so that you may help to reach another soul for Jesus Christ. Works, temple, desecration. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Family things can be so funny. Herb's wife, Barbara, kept little Jojo, and Herb and Barbara only have one son, and he's turning 15, already turning 15. And it's not exactly easy to grow up in a home where there's just one. Or where you're the baby. I was the only boy in our home. And to save my life even today, I can't stand kids around me with sticky on them. Just never could. I, my wife, I embarrass her, and I go into a restaurant, and if, if it's if they're sticky on the table, you know, and sometimes it's that way. We eat in places where they don't have tablecloths every time when you're traveling. I'll say to the waitress, get this sticky stuff off. I can't stand sticky stuff. Well, the other day, Jojo had been eating candy, and he came around Stevie, and Steve said, Mother said, get him. He's sticky. Well, to Steve, Jojo was defiled, you know, had sticky stuff on him. And babies have a way of getting sticky stuff on you, <laughs> you know. But did you notice this? Defile the temple? Are you defiling the temple? Are you defiled? Do you have habits? Do you have habits? Let me ask you. Do you have habits that's displeasing to God? Take, for instance, many of you men and women who smoke. If you put that money in missions, you'd be surprised in a lifetime how many thousands of dollars you'd invest. Besides, you wouldn't have to pay a doctor bill uh, with your insurance dying with cancer, lung cancer. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe somebody run over and kill you and save all of the expense of a doctor bill. You'd be surprised how fortunate that'd be maybe for your wife, <laughs> you know. Man, if you can't joke about... If you can't joke about your last enemy a little bit, I don't know how you're going to be able to face him anyway. But do you have habits? Defile the temple? Now look at verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. Very personal, isn't it? If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Brother Charlie, you want me to come for Monday night visitation, Tuesday night? Look, I have to work. Isn't it strange how some people sitting here this morning think that you have to work more than some of the rest of us, and the rest of us can visit on Monday night. You don't have time because you work. You know what you are? You're just one big old liar, that's all. Making excuses, and someone has said that that's what an excuse really is. You have as much time to serve God as anybody else if you get this in your heart like you ought to. 
And after all, it's for your benefit. Now, you may not be able to come for visitation. I'm not going to be that narrow. Now, get it straight. But you know what you can do? You can take a Bob Harrington card, a little old card like this. You can have these. You can have tracts to pass out. You can give a word of testimony on the job daily. You'll have a thousand opportunities to minister. You don't have to come for visitation. Get that out of your head. It helps the rest of us that have the opportunity to come in to encourage whenever others come. There has to be set times, but if your work is such that you can't come, don't let it discourage you. Keep witnessing. Keep moving. Keep strengthening. Dr. Ford Porter wrote a tract, God's Simple Plan of Salvation, and I moved to this country 21 years ago up here. The tract, oh, it was fairly well known. I didn't have time to write a tract. Second place, didn't have sense enough to write one like ought to be written, I suppose. And I know Ford Porter to be one of the greatest men of prayer that I've ever seen. And I've got, God has given me good common horse sense. And I figured this, man of prayer as much as Ford Porter has, He's in close touch with the Lord. In all probability, he can write a better track than some of the rest of us could. It's busy a lot of the time. Don't have time to pray as much as he does. So I started promoting the tract, God's Simple Plan of Salvation. We've ordered them by, by 100,000 lots here at our church. And did you know, ladies and gentlemen, that that ministry has doubled and tripled and quadrupled in this number of years and if I'd have been ill, I would have been the speaker at the anniversary recently uh, for Dr. Porter over at uh, Indianapolis uh, for this for this tract. And Dr. Bob Jones and a lot of other men. But it asked me to come and bring the, de the, this, the, the dedication message again, the anniversary message, and, and uh, that the future of that tract might be even greater than it's ever been. Uh, man, I didn't put much into it, but in meetings I'd, I'd talk to these preachers about getting these tracts in the hands of your people. And, you know, they started buying them and uh, having them imprinted with the pastor picture and the, uh, the, the location and so forth. And millions of those tracts, and I think I can say this humbly, uh, that today that tract perhaps is being used of God as no other tract in America. I've had just a little part in it. What, what are you doing? You know, some of you have got children and grandchildren. And some of you have kids, grandkids, that have musical ability of that equal to Mike Evans. But have you given them a chance? Over at Harold's yesterday morning when I went in, I heard two violins and a cello. John and Jimmy and Kathy were playing their music. They're under the instruction of a great Jewish artist, musician in this city, whose father has sung with metropolitan operas all over the world. And that young man and his wife have, have done so much for our grandchildren, for which I am duly thankful. But if Harold and Sylvia had not taken the time and effort those children wouldn't be developing the talent that is inherent in them. Now, what they do with it from here, I do not know. But they, your child, no telling what your son may do. Give him a chance. Somebody said, well, I don't think you ought to do that. I think you ought to. I think they need to be encouraged. This young man that's teaching back here, our college and career class, I remember one day when he came to me and Said he wanted, he felt God wanted to use him. Today he's a fine doctor in our city. I tried to give him encouragement when I could give him encouragement. And I'm wondering today if you, to, if you are not guilty of not even developing or helping develop your children and your grandchildren to do for them what you ought to. God help you to see that it's not just standing in the pulpit to preach. Or putting a $20 bill or a $50 check in the offering. It's you. That's what I'm talking about. You. God wants you. The saints at Antioch first gave themselves unto the Lord. I say this today. I stood at my door and paced that solarium there at, our, at the apartment here last Sunday morning like a cage lion. 
as I watch my men get in the buses and drive them off these vast parking lots and to go out throughout the city, traveling several hundreds of miles to pick up boys and girls, I found myself praying, Oh, my God, use these boys and girls. Save them. Move them. Use them. I'd hate to think that you and I'd be so trite and so shallow to just bring them in and then not accompany bringing them in with prayer that God would take them and use them and mold them and shape them and make them. That's what it means. Did you notice... Let no man deceive himself. Verse 21, Therefore let no man glory in man, for all things are yours. I would remind you that we are clay in the hands of the potter. Now I would remind you this morning that in my own personal prayer life, and I presume it's yours too, hardest thing I've ever done is to lay it all on the altar because it's so easy to keep back. I, I'll be honest, I, and I don't want the word fear to be used in an inappropriate way here. But when I pray, oh God, whatever it takes to mold me and shape me, go ahead and do it. I've never prayed that prayer one summer but what I've trembled. And I have a little fear that, you know... Because, brother, when you pray a prayer like that, God is going to move in. And I've got news for you, it's going to cost you something. Never will you pray that prayer for what it involves something. But on the, in the end, it's better. It's better. And whenever the flesh gets through trembling and shaking, and all, oh, it's still better. Lord... We ought to obey thee rather than men. All right, now, verse 21 said, All things belong to you. And then Paul even takes himself. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas. Well, you know, in a very real sense, and I tell young preachers this, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a intangible. It's one of the intangibles. And it's not a mushy thing, it's an intangible. And it's why we have to be so careful, one of the reasons why. But look, the man of God ought to, in a very real sense, belong to you. And if today you cannot say, wholeheartedly, my preacher, my staff member, My singer, my associate, there ought to be an intimate thing there where God's people rises above the flesh so that the Spirit of God can do His work. Now, verse 1 of chapter 4, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God that you be found faithful. Now Paul says it doesn't make a whole lot of difference what you think of me in the ultimate, but it's what you think of the one I represent, God, who is the judge of all men. And my dear friend, he's going to judge us, and that's what I want to close with today. Sure, as the sun rises and sets, he's going to judge us. He's going to judge us. Judgment day is coming. You say, well, Christians, I didn't think. Oh, yes. Every work shall be brought into judgment, whether they be good or bad. And I tell you now, there's but a heartbeat that separates you from the judgment day. From judgment. And when it comes, it's coming with all honesty. For he shall judge with equity the earth, and he's going to judge. Are you ready for it? Can you honestly say that each day of my life, it's his? Well, if it can't, let's start today. If it can't, let's, uh, let's begin now. If you haven't, then let's do it. Because this is God's doings. 
This is God's word. This is God's relationship. This is God's right. It's his privilege. And today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of redemption. Today is the day of calling. Today is the day of submission. Today is the day of surrender. Today is the day when you say to Jesus Christ, Here I am, Lord, take me. And as an adult, and perhaps a baby in your arms, or a grandparent, or maybe you've never been privileged to have children or anything of this sort, but you have your life to invest, and your talents and your gifts, that you may continue to reach out until you have planted seeds that will bring a harvest, that will bear fruit. Oh, what a day, what a blessed day. And like Mike was singing a while ago, I should have been crucified. And so should I. But in my stead he took my guilt and my sins and my punishment and I went free. And today I am free indeed and dwelling within my heart is the Holy Spirit. And all he asked me to do today is to serve him. And he's asking you to do that. Let's stand please for the invitation. Everyone standing. And in this quiet moment, let me ask a question. You can honestly and truly say, Mr. Rawlings, I know I've been saved. Lift your hand if you know it.